Hello, everyone. Um, good to see you. I am already having a couple of technical difficulties, just they're moving the slides around. So my name is Katie and I'm with uh, Marine Extension, um, UGA's Marine Extension Georgia Sea Grant. I'm a marine educator here and um, I coordinate our volunteer program and focus much of my energy on professional development and programming. We're also going to be joined, um, as you have already learned, by Kayla Clark, who is um, our, pro our public programs coordinator here at UGA Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant. Abby Sterling is the shorebird biologist for Manimit. Um, she works with the, throughout the Georgia Bight um, on the conservation and shorebird conservation initiative. And she's located in Brunswick, Georgia, but works up and down the Southeast coast. Abby, would you like to give us a little bit more about your position? Yeah, I just wanted to um, introduce everyone to Manomet who may not be familiar with it. Um, we are a nonprofit organization that's 50 years old this year, um, based up in Massachusetts, um, with a focus on using science to increase uh, sustainability, with a significant emphasis on recovering shorebird populations through research, network building, and management. So like Katie said, I'm based locally here in Brunswick, um, working on the Georgia Bite Shorebird Conservation Initiative, which we launched in 2018. And we are also fortunate enough to be joined by Fran and Catherine LaPola, who are co-owners of Savannah Coastal Eco Tours. Catherine focuses on kayak tours and Fran on charter boats. They're both motivated by their desire to share our special coastline with those who want to visit it. Um, and we have Stacia Hendricks, who is a naturalist and environmental educator with Little St. Simons Island. She's a long-term Georgia resident and has shared her love of the coast with numerous visit visitors and tourists. Our goals today for this webinar, um, this is actually part, um, this lecture is part of a coastal incentive grant that it's managed through the coastal um, Coastal um, Resources Division of Georgia DNR. Um, we're going to talk quite a bit about the importance of our coastline in this lecture. We're going to talk about shorebirds and their needs, um, as well as human needs along the coastline. We're going to be talking about um, addressing threats for shorebird conservation. And we're gonna be talking very importantly about building connections. Um, this project is all about building connections, working with um, tour guides and looking at ecotourism as a way of connecting our public and the human um, occupants of Georgia with our wildlife um, and shorebirds. We're also gonna be asking for some public input during this webinar. Um, and mm -hmm. I will have the pleasure of walking you through how we're going to be doing some of that um, input. So for those of you who don't have a smartphone and still want to participate, you can use um, this Pull Everywhere program to actually go onto um, a URL or onto the web. Um, you go to pullev.com. You're going to enter the text KDH 770, all is one word, to be able to enter our poll for this program. If you have a smartphone or text capability on your phone, you're going to text to the number 22333, and you're going to include KDH770 as your text message. All right? It's going to look like this if you're using a phone. Again, your recipient is going to be 22333. You're going to type in the words KDH770 as one word. It doesn't matter if it's capitalized or not. Once you've hit enter on that message, you should get a little message telling you that you have joined this poll. All right, so hopefully everybody's getting a chance to actually sign on because I'm gonna ask you your first question just to make sure that we're all able to have some input. So this first question, <clears throat> is indicating how often you depend on local tour guides while visiting coastal waterways. And that could be coastal waterways wherever you are. So all you'll do is 
when, um, let's see, you will type in A, B, C, D, or E as your answer. So all you have to do is text in the, the letter that is corresponding to how often you depend on local tour guides while using coastal waterways. And as folks are doing this, we'll be able to see your responses. It looks like a lot of you have already been able to go in there, give you a couple more, maybe another minute to reply. And I know we had one question in the chat box about sharing the information about how to access that poll. Um, so the information is at the top of the screen. Um, that first line is how you would uh, do it online on a computer, and the second line is how you would do it by phone. And I'll also put that in the chat as well. And that will come up for each question, so you'll be reminded as we're going through. All right. So it looks like several of you have been able to respond. Um, I haven't seen numbers change for a little while, so we're going to go ahead and start with the presentation. I'm going to pass. Um, I'm going to pass off the presentation to Abby Sterling. Great. Um, thank you so much, Katie. We're so excited for y'all to join us uh, today. Um, so before uh, we get too far into this, I want to take a step back and look at the big picture of our coast. And so we are part of uh, the Georgia Bight, and that's the curved part of the coast from Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, down to Cape Canaveral in Florida. And, and the Georgia Bight has a lot of critical habitat for shorebirds, particularly from Northeast Florida to South Carolina, including the Georgia coast. In recognition of this critical habitat, there are actually three Western Hemisphere shorebird reserve network sites within the bite. The Altamaha River Delta, the Georgia Barrier Islands, which are a landscape of hemispheric importance, and Cape Romaine Santee Delta region up in South Carolina. And so because of the, the numbers of birds that use these places, they've been recognized as important uh, and are part of the Western Hemisphere uh, shorebird reserve network. Now, the recipe, uh, <laughs> you know, the recipe for creating um, good shorebird habitat comes from the geography of the bite. And so you can see the curve of the coastline and the distance between the edge of the coastline and the continental shelf there on the left-hand panel of this diagram uh, creates some really important things that happen. Because it's so shallow, we have a uh, very low wave energy, which is the dark line in the center panel. And we also have very high tidal amplitudes in the Georgia Bight. And so because of that, we have well-defined uh, barrier islands, huge chances of salt marsh, and lots of sand, sandbars and mud flats for shorebirds uh, to feed on and roost at. We also have, if you look at the right panel, a lot of inlets, places where rivers are coming out to the ocean. And so that's that black line in the middle showing you that there's a lot of inlets as you get towards the center of the curved part of the bite. And those inlets are very close together, which is shown by the bars as you get to the center of the bite. And because of that, we have a lot of sediment uh, and uh, nutrients that are coming down uh, through those river systems and creating what is a very highly dynamic landscape. It's always shifting and changing. And because of that, it creates really good habitat for shorebirds. So you can see this aerial imagery taken uh, of snapshots over a, a period of 30 years shows you just how dynamic our coastline is. I think there might be a couple more. And if you can recognize this place, um, add it to the chat box, um, kind of fun. Some of you might be able to recognize this little inlet very easily. Um, so additionally, we get to experience a relatively natural, undeveloped coastline, especially when compared to other areas along the Atlantic. This is a huge draw for both wildlife and for people. Specifically, for shorebirds, the Georgia Bight offers extensive remote beaches on our barrier islands, this huge tidal range that creates vast expanses of mud and sand flats, that hold abundant food resources for shorebirds. 
We have the Altamaha River and other large estuaries uh, that bring down sediments and bring down nutrients that help really create a lot of good food resources. There's also minimal shoreline engineering and very few modified inlets along the Georgia Bight and a lot of areas with limited disturbance as well as impoundments and managed wetlands. So all of these are reasons that the Georgia coast can support nearly 300,000 shorebirds year round. So with that, we, have, we come to the second question that we have on here. And this one is um, looking at content um, information that tour guides give you when addressing um, when you're on a guided tour of the Georgia coastal waterways, but this can also be other waterways. I know that we have folks joining us from all over. So in this particular um, answer, if you can use one word answers or very short answers, um, it will be best because we're gonna build a word cloud. Again, to get on here, you can join by text or you can join on the web. Um, it should be the same poll. So if you've already acted this, activated this on your phone, it should work just fine. Um, we're going to be able to start building a word cloud that, with this one. So all you need to do is put in information on what content, if any, you would want addressed during a guided tour of Georgia's coastal waterways. So this might be anything from natural history to plant identification, et cetera. I think you, you may have to activate it, Katie. I thought I had. Okay. All right, so we are starting to see things come up on this. Excellent. So sediment distribution. Again, you can see some of the words might get separated out there if you're using multiple words in your answer. You can fix that by putting a hyphen between the words if you wanna use multiple word um, descriptions. Natural history, history. Awesome. Of course, shorebirds, excellent. Identification. All right. And I know we had at least one question in the inlet was. That was the response that most people thought those pictures were from before Abby. Yes. And other folks are wondering if you could locate us to where that is. Yep. So that is Gould's Inlet, and it's right uh, on St. Simons between Sea Island and St. Simons. And so um, a real great place for shorebirds on St. Simons. We had a couple All right. That right. It's great. Awesome. All right, so it looks like most people have already given their answers. I'm going to move on. Um, so the Georgia coast is important for shorebirds really throughout the entire year. And this is something that makes it fairly unique among other places. Um, so we're important for shorebirds during both fall and spring migration. Uh, during the winter for species like the federally endangered piping plover, and during the spring and summer for nesting seasons. Um, despite all of this great habitat that we have, there are some significant threats to our shorebirds here in Georgia. So today we're going to talk about disturbance. We're also going to talk about some of the excellent tools that we have to address these threats. Things like partnerships, education and outreach, research and management. So some of the most critical places for shorebirds uh, on the Georgia coast are the more remote parts of our coast that can be pretty difficult to access. So there's places like inlets at the end of the barrier islands, places like remote sandbars in our sounds, and shell rakes made up of deposited oyster shells that line our marshes. Now, before we talk about how you shorebirds use these places, it's helpful to make sure we're all on the same page about what a shorebird actually is. Uh, they have generally long bills and long legs. They don't have webbed feet, they can't swim, and they use those long bills to probe down into the mud or the sand to look for invertebrates and insects to eat. 
So you're often going to find shorebirds in wet areas where water meets land. So when we think about shorebirds, we're talking about often sandpipers and plovers and birds like oyster catchers. They have variable bills with different shapes and lengths to allow them to specialize on different foods. Um, and so you can see the oyster catcher that eats oysters, wimbrels, and Wilson's plovers that eat fiddler crabs, shorebirds eating all sorts of different invertebrates and insects. They also have eggs and chicks that are well adapted to blend in with their surroundings. So they're very cryptic. Now shorebirds this time of the year are doing two things on the Georgia coast. They're nesting and they're migrating. Migrating shorebirds travel in large flocks, some from the very ends of South America, flying north to their Arctic nesting sites. One of the most well-known migrating shorebird is the federally threatened Rufa red knot. But there are a number of different Arctic nesting species that depend on our coast during these tremendous journeys. So today we're just going to talk a little bit about the red knot, which is one of the most well-known Arctic nesting migrants. And some of the red knots that we see here on the Georgia coast are traveling from all the way down in southern South America, Tierra del Fuego, and making tremendous multi-day flights, some of these journeys taking thousands of miles, where birds are flying nonstop, flapping their wings the entire time, and coming to rest and refuel at, at very important key places. Now these are small birds, they're about the size of a robin if you haven't seen them, and they depend on, um, on these key sites with what we call site fidelity. And so this is uh, a way that birds are able to hone in on certain places where there's enough food resources and there's enough good safe places for them to rest, and every single migration they'll stop at those very same places. Uh, so right now, horseshoe crab eggs are a very important food resource for these shorebirds. And this is an energy source that literally fuels them as they fly up to the Arctic. Marked individuals help us know where birds stop and what places we need to protect so they can survive these tremendous journeys. One great example is a red knot who has uh, the code B95 on the orange flag that it wears around its leg. And it was recited every single year for 18 years in Delaware Bay. It was calculated that uh, over the course of that migration, the bird actually traveled the distance to the moon and back during its lifetime. And so this is a federally listed threatened species due to population declines. Now our Georgia coast provides food resources so the birds can nearly double their body weight on these migration journeys. Um, and so uh, they store all of that as fuel that takes them on that four to five day flight, flapping their wings nonstop up to the Arctic. Another great example is the wimbrel, this guy here on the left, that feeds on fiddler crabs during the spring. So you can see from that graph over the course of four weeks that the wimbrels are here on the coast of Georgia, they nearly double their body weight in preparation for the journey to the Arctic. Nesting is also happening on our beaches at this time of the year. A few priority species that I wanted to mention today are American oyster catchers, Wilson's plovers, least terns, and black skimmers. Beach nesting shorebirds, like American oyster catchers and Wilson's plovers, nest out on open sand or on shell rakes. Adults incubate nests to protect them from overheating in the sun and to protect them from predators with displays like a broken wing display you can see here from this Wilson's plover, where they pretend that they're hurt to lure a predator or a biologist away from their nest um, and, and keep those eggs safe. So birds make a shallow depression in the sand and then they lay their eggs in that, in that depression um, and they blend in perfectly with their surroundings. In about 25 days, the eggs hatch into fluffy precocial chicks that are able to get up, run around, and leave the nest site within hours and move around the beach with their parents to find food and safe hiding places as a family. It can take 40 days before these chicks are able to fly, so they're vulnerable for a long time. Beach nesting seabirds, like least terns and black skimmers, also nest on remote beaches on the Georgia coast and on sandbars as well. These birds nest in big groups uh, instead of singularly, like oyster catchers and Wilson's plovers. So this is a lot like a neighborhood. 
um, of, of uh, birds that all work together to have group defenses like calling and flying and dive bombing to keep their eggs and chicks safe. So generally shorebirds need safe, quiet places with few predators and few disturbances to feed, to rest, and to raise their chicks. Shorebird populations are experiencing significant declines, which you can see in the chart there on the left. That's data that's been collected over a period from 1974 to present. The dark line is a conglomeration of all of these different species, but you can see individual species on that chart. Um, and you can see the majority of them are showing a downward trend. One of the leading factors is habitat loss, and this is where uh, disturbance comes into play. Recreational disturbance because of driving, which is not a big problem at the remote sites that I'm talking about, recreational disturbance because of people, and recreational disturbance because of dogs mean that habitat that could be really good for shorebirds is no longer suitable. So whether that recreational disturbance directly impacts chicks, either keeping parents away from chicks um, or through inadvertent uh, loss of chicks, little Wilson's plovers, our tiny little um, fluff balls, you can see that one hiding in the footprint just for scale. Um, or direct mortality of chicks can be a significant problem during nesting. And disturbance during migration can be really problematic as well. Interrupting the short window when the tide is perfect for birds to feed or flushing birds that are trying to build up energy reserves where they're going to be soon flying thousands of miles up to the Arctic. Recreational disturbance can reduce weight gain, it can reduce survival, and it can impact reproductive success for these birds. So a lot of what we can do as a community is to raise awareness. Disturbing nesting birds leaves eggs and chicks vulnerable to overheating from the sun or vulnerable to predators. Dogs can chase or scare birds that might be preparing to migrate or they can chase flightless chicks. Showing people how they can share beaches with shorebirds is very important. Um, and, oh, oh. <laughs> and avoiding sensitive places like inlets, rakes, and remote bars at certain times of the year can give shorebirds a better chance of survival. Shorebirds help connect us to communities across the entire hemisphere and allow us to be good hosts to world travelers. They can help build pride in the local community, but conservation of these birds requires co cooperation. One way that we can learn more about our incredible environment and connect communities and visitors to the wildlife that depends on our coast is through ecotourism. So ecotourism is defined as uh, responsible travel to natural areas that conserves the environment, sustains the well-being of local people, and involves interpretation and education. Many people in the ecotourism community work hard to protect and promote our natural places. And ecotourism can help link guides, communities, and tourists to our resource managers, the people that are actually trying to protect these important places that shorebirds need. So with that, we have more input from you all. Um, in this one, we're gonna use again, one word or short answers. Using hyphens between the answers will help um, for this to be effective. Again, you can use the same text. If you've done this before, you can see the information on top. Awesome. We're already getting some input from this one. All right, so good recommendations. The length of the, the tour, tour leaders and their knowledge. Price is certainly of interest, knowledge of, their co of the coast, accessibility, that makes a lot of sense. Good answers. Sustainability is a big one in there. 
You can see as you're answering this, if folks are using the same word multiple times, the word gets bigger in this cloud. So it makes it more important. We can see the things that most interest you and most influence you about your choice of Ecotour operators. And since we had a few folks join us late, just a reminder that if you have any questions during the program, you can enter them in the chat box um, by clicking chat and that will open up your chat box as well. And currently there's information on how to get into the poll in that box. Great. All right, it's starting to slow down. Maybe give it another couple of seconds here to have folks put their information in. ATIG certification, that's great. So that is an environmental education certification for folks. So knowledge, again, it sounds like is important. All right, so Abby, back to you. All right, um, so partnering with the ecotourism industry to address the threats of recreational disturbance uh, allows us to connect people with places and build support for conservation while recognizing um, that ecotourism is a major economic driver in our coastal communities. And so um, we wanted to just be able to hear from some of our partners in that industry and, and sort of hear a little bit about some of the experiences that they've had in terms of, of leading people to some of these really incredible places. And so first we're going to hear from Fran and Catherine, thank you both so much for joining us. Um, we're going to make sure that you're unmuted here. There you go. Um, yeah, so just take it away. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you for including us. Uh, we are the owner operators of uh, Savannah Coastal Eco Tours, and we do custom private guided kayak and boat tours. Um, we do this because we think this coast is a treasure and we enjoy sharing it with people, educating them about it. Um, it's largely been spared all out development and has an amazing amount of uh, pristine waterways. <laughs> okay. Hi. We uh, um, normally go to, uh, out to the barrier islands and um, we do, we educate. Um, it, it, we're, we're so fortunate to have um, roughly, you know, one third of all the remaining salt marsh on the East Coast. Um, it's, it's like 400, I mean, you know, 400,000 acres. Um, we have 5,000 miles of navigable waterways in a very short coast. And, and it, it, it's very u unique. And, we tend to think of the um, uh, the marshes in Georgia as it's kind of like the Amazon rainforest of, of the marine mm. environment. It is so critical to so many marine species and shorebirds, and, and uh, the interrelationship is is um, uh, is complex, and it's very amazing. And we, uh, as has been stated, we are lucky enough to have. Um, undeveloped, many undeveloped barrier islands, which have miles of beach and, um, and, and hammocks also. <clears throat> and uh, some of the things that we you know, educate uh, about, we, we, we talk about the coast itself, the environment. Um, we show um, our evidence of the rise in sea level. It's very easy to show with, um, uh, saltwater intrusion on the small hammocks just inches above sea level. So we use teachable moments as they happen. Um, we talk about migrations, we talk about the interrelations of uh, food sources like with the horseshoe crabs and the migrating shorebirds. Uh, we might talk about turtle nesting. We certainly talk about the Marine Mammal Protection Act and why we keep our distance. And uh, the way that we try to ameliorate our impact on, on shorebirds, actually, especially, <clears throat> um, we, we, we travel uh, on our, all our tours with a, a um, good camera with 300 millimeter lens and binoculars. So we can, 
we can um, view from afar without uh, disturbing or minimizing our disturbance. And um, what we uh, what we do is all, all the images that we take with the with the you know 300 millimeter lens, we throw in a DVD and mail them out to the people afterwards. And if they had questions, we couldn't answer them at the time. For example, all the small shorebirds, if it's not a ruddy turnstone, I can't identify it. So <laughs> LBJ, okay? Until I have the book and the image. So uh, we do see problems uh, as we um, explore our coast. Um, one of those being unleashed dogs on beaches or uh, children or, or adults um, sometimes chasing birds. Um, just to make them fly. Um, we see foot traffic occasionally beyond that high tide line. Uh, marine debris is increasingly an issue. Uh, loud music, and we use those as teachable moments. Uh, one, one thing that's uh, just occurred to me that, that has come up and we've noticed in the uh, uh, past month or so with the, um, with the COVID virus is that there are a gazillion boats out there. No, normally, it's, it's pretty quiet on the coast. And all the uh, popular beaches on the barrier islands are just jam-packed on a weekend. So um, uh, obviously, the virus <laughs> impacts more than just you know, individuals. So, so that's basically it. Well, thank you so much for that perspective. I think that's. Um, you know, just having having your experience of being on the ground and really um, helping helping explain that you know protecting these places is is good for conservation and good for business and, and doing what you can to make sure that um, these habitats remain viable you know for the wild that depends on them. So I think it's I think it's it's such a good um, way to highlight those partnerships. We're also going to hear from Stacia. Um, who's joining us, maybe, there she is, sure. um, who's been connecting people with nature throughout her whole career, bouncing all around the Georgia coast. Well, hello and good afternoon. It's what a treat to be here and, and be on this side of a webinar. I've really enjoyed the uh, teachable moments of all the things I've, I've, I've been able to learn um, with this uh, COVID-19 uh, lifestyle of being at home. Um, it's sort of weird to not have the, the beach beneath our feet and the sky above us, but uh, I, I uh, will embrace this opportunity to share what I can with our audience today. So one of the things that I think is so extraordinary is our, is our coastline. And, I um, began working in a research lab for EPA many moons ago and found my way to the Georgia coast in the mid 80s. And um, I, I found my way to Cumberland and I worked with the family at Grayfield for 14 years. And that is where I really feel like my education began uh, with a focus on natural history. You know, I had the ologies. But then I, I began to expand my understanding of these landscapes and to be able to live in them in these remote landscapes is, has been such a privilege for me. So I, I was on Cumberland for many moons and that's where I really, shall I say, cut my teeth on um, teaching, experiential education and uh, engaging people in landscapes that they may be not familiar with and they might be frightened of. and um, open their eyes to the magic and, um, mm. and have developed these relationships with people that go back to the mid eighties. And it's also when I began to understand about what it's taken to put these places on the map. So many people in the state of Georgia had no idea that their own state had a coast. And um, I think maybe that had to do with the fact that for many folks, you can't get to these landscapes without a boat. And so their accessibility was, of course, as far as they were concerned, there was no coast. And so um, Georgia's coast of 14 major islands and um, 100 miles of coast 
seven river basins that drain to our coast, enriching these estuaries. So as a shorebird flies ab above our coastline, uh, what a grocery store. And not only that, but the things we're beginning to learn about the fish that use these landscapes and um, these estuaries and migrate up these rivers, these natal rivers for, for spawning. Um, and the technology that has been in my tenure on the coast, given us the perspectives of these extraordinary journeys that these birds traverse, these global citizens that visit our coast, most commonly semi-annually, and uh, for our, us to have the opportunity to get to know them. Uh, so I find myself engaged in, in um, helping people see things, whether they're right in front of them. And I'll give you a quick little um, story. I was I worked for um, the Sea Island Company of the Cloister for many moons and uh, did a weekly bird walk on the beach and were, had scopes out on the beach. And there are probably 400 black skimmers on the beach. And this guy, who was a regular, walked right through the middle of these birds. And of course, they flushed. These were black skimmers. And he came over to us and he said, what are you all doing? And we said, well, we were watching the birds that you just walked right through the middle of. And he said, what birds? <laughs> and so, you know, it's all a matter of how we see the world around us. And so from that point forward, he became very intrigued and um, became someone who was interested in learning about these, these um, people that share the beach with him on his daily walks. So that was a win. And also um, for people to understand the cause and effect of their actions. And so very often folks have no idea that the reason that a bird is pecking on their head is because they're so close to a rookery, uh, one of the nesting sites, or they're about to step on one of their babies. And so again, it's opening people's eyes to the magic of these landscapes. And, um, you know, and I'll just finish with one fun story as um, we were taking a bunch of kids saning and um, this, what we were also, um, in the process, before the saning, we were releasing a baby sea turtle that we had, from our sea turtle program, had to release from one that didn't get out from the nest, uh, the, from the time when we uh, were uh, excavating it. And all the kids, we had them carefully line up and watch these baby turtles make their way to the water. And then we let them go in the water after the turtles were far beyond the shore and all the kids were in the water with them. And they had named him, of course. And um, one of the moms was standing on the beach crying. And I said, are you okay? And she said, this is the first time my child has ever been in the water. And so to think about how nature engages an audience to bring them forward. And, and he was terrified of the water um, for reasons I do not understand. But anyway, all of a sudden, nature was the link. And so I, I just use that to celebrate the, the magic of opportunities that I have had the privilege of uh, sharing with people in these lands. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you so much for sharing those thoughts, Stacia. Sure. Um, I think really, yeah, again, just highlighting the incredible ways um, that learning our coast better can really help people connect with it. And, and I think that really highlights the value of building these connections and engaging this ecotourism community to address one of these big issues like disturbance. And so we do have a number of ways to address disturbance, you know, using things like signs and parking areas off with symbolic fencing and ropes and stakes. Um, and there's also some very large scale ways to try to address disturbance. Um, there's a, a large project through National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, Virginia Tech, and National Audubon that we're also working on uh, at Manomet to look at addressing disturbance across the whole entire Atlantic flyway. Um, so numerous partners that are involved in this because it is uh, such a significant issue. And so one of the tools that we're working on that we're really excited about um, that we wanted to tell you about today is this, uh, this program that Katie is going to talk about. So yeah, the, um, the lecture that we're doing today is part of this funded program um, through the Coastal Incentive Grant. And um, we're dubbing this program the Coastal Awareness and Responsible Ecotourism Certification Program. Um, and it has been inspired by some of these stories about shorebirds 
um, and you know the importance of shore, the Georgia coast to the shorebirds and their migration. But the program itself is um, obviously very focused also on human needs. And so thinking about our coast from you know, our own eyes, um, over 50% of the current US population is now living in coastal areas. And that population is simply going to be increasing. And we know as individuals, you know, I grew up in Ohio. I did not grow up on the coast. The coast was a place for vacation. So when my family and I came to the coast, we didn't know what was happening and wouldn't know a shorebird from a seabird necessarily visiting from areas that, that don't see these species very often. Um, so tourism, ecotourism is important um, for building those connections. So as um, Stacia so um, nicely put it, making those individual sort of connections to nature um, and often making sure that those connections are coming through a knowledgeable, um, a knowledgeable channel. So um, the CARE certification is a two-year funded project and it's designed to help build those connections um, between the tourism community and our biologists and our naturalists on the coast and help leverage that ecotourism to help protect our coast for both humans and for wildlife. Um, we will be um, starting workshop program, um, workshop portion of this. We've been working this first year and engaging um, tour guides and finding out their level of interest, um, trying to design the workshops themselves and make sure that we're addressing um, some of the questions that we're asking you today. So what are things of interest for tour, um, for uh, those that are um, actually patronizing these um, tour um, sit, these tour uh, programs and finding out what kinds of things are important to um, tourists who are coming to visit, but also from the tour guide perspective, what do they want and, and how can they be supported? Um, so we're going to be offering um, guidelines and best practices, training and learning opportunities, um, lam a laminated guidebook so that uh, Fran and Catherine have that ability to identify those shorebirds when they see them in the field, um, and access to uh, citizen science tools. So this ability to actually collect real data um, when we're out in the field. There are a lot of citizen science tools that are out there and a lot of the naturalists and biologists use them to collect data that they use for management purposes. We'll be um, introducing guides to using those citizen science tools. And of course, overall, increasing the, the communication amongst our partners along the coast. So building those connections um, between you know, those who manage, biologists, et cetera, tourists and tour guides, but also within the tour guide community, making sure that folks are um, being able to, to build that communication. With that, um, we have, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to do a little bit of um, cleanup here. I did, I'm not sure what I did here. Give me just one moment. I need to get rid of you all so I can see what's happening. So I wanna clear the responses on this one. This is our last question that we have out there. And I would like to know what resources you use to research outdoor outfitters. Um, this is going to be able to be helpful in our ability to get out there and um, get our logo, logo out there and make sure that those eco tour guides that are certified in the CARE program are reaching those who are visiting the coast. I see that most of you are already responding. You can respond as many times as you want to on this. So if you use social media and tourism bureaus, please go ahead and feel free to put both A and E in there. This is great. So many of you are participating. Wonderful. Looks like word of mouth is a big one. Um, I think that's probably true for most of us here on the Georgia coast. I know we depend on one another. Um, internet searches are going to be out there as well. So making sure that the logo has a high profile on the internet. Wonderful. 
And if there are other organizations that you work with, um, feel free to, to put that information in the chat box while you're filling this out. So if there are organizations that we're just, you're afraid we're gonna miss in this, um, please feel free to send that out in the chat. Wonderful, all right. So, um, so that you know you can continue to um, put information in that poll as we're talking through this slideshow, that should still be open. Um, if you are interested in joining the community, the, build, the community that we're building here, um, if you are a tour operator, you can join us. Um, we have a survey that we have sent out to our tour operators to find out more information about what they would like to see in this certification program. If you want to advertise the certification program at your business, um, you want to help give us a give our tour operators and this program a leg up you should certainly get in touch with us. And if you are general public and you, you like to get out on the coast and you wanna learn more, um, please feel free to get in touch with us. Our information is here at the bottom of this slide and we can um, also send that out in a follow-up email. We will be sending you a follow-up email to this. And with that, we'd like to open it up for questions and answers. So this is for you all. We're gonna go ahead and turn on our, um, our all of our microphones and our uh, cameras and take questions and answers. Kayla is gonna be moderating here and trying to get your questions to the appropriate people. We're going to have we're going to have participants type their questions into the chat box. We're not going to unmute everyone. So um, right, sorry if I, yes. if I need that. <laughs> so if you have any questions, please um, feel free to type them there in the chat box, and we would love to, love to answer them. Fantastic. And while folks are thinking of questions and entering them into the chat box, we did have a few that came up during the program that people were wondering. One of them is from Adam. And he was wondering, and I think this was in reference to the slide that you had, Abby, that had um, a graph of shorebird mm -hmm. trends. And he yes. was wondering, what is the theory behind white rubbed sandpiper, willet, and avocet population gains while all other shorebirds are declining? Yeah, that's a really great question, Adam. Um, and, um, you know, I'm not honestly 100% sure. I think there's definitely some some level of variability in the trends, and um, and there's probably um, a couple of different reasons for all of those uh, those those different um, kind of increasing or stable looking populations. And so, I'm going to actually look for the. I'm not sure if that is published yet, um, and I'm certain that there's Manomet folks on here that are probably. Um, banging their head against the table that I'm answering this so poorly. So uh, if anyone else has that, but I can definitely get in touch with you, Adam, and we can talk more about it. Um, and I can show up the actual publication and the, the figure that's got some, some reference to error and some variability in those trends. Thanks, Abby. Um, one of the other questions that we had was whether or not eco tours are handicap accessible. Yeah, I think um, we can partly answer that. Um, we do, uh, we've had people uh, who have uh, been in wheelchairs who are blind or who are infirm or um, autistic or, or whatever, many, but um, most tour operators, including us, are not set up for every handicap uh, that you can think of. and. Um, Part of that is because of inspections from uh, the Coast Guard, which don't inspect uh, uh, small vessels. Um, uh, so consequently, um, uh, it presents a problem. <laughs> so, but for ourselves, we, we handle as, 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 as much as we can and... Uh, it just depends. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Fran. Um, similar, on the vein of, of eco tours and how to get involved. Um, someone was asking earlier on 
how they could bring a school group um, to do a tour with Eustacia and if you do if you do tours for school students. Well, where I currently am engaged over at Little St. Simons, it's a little bit um, of a hike, but there are some opportunities and um, maybe I'll, we could share my contact information and I'd be happy to help organize an adventure for little people and big people. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Yeah. We also had a question about if this presentation will be available to watch online later. Um, that is our intention with recording it, um, but we'll have to stay tuned as to where that will end up. I will put in the chat box both our organization's website uh, for UGA Marine Extension, as well as Manomets, um, so that you have access to all the resources that both of those websites um, include. I do know, Kayla, we can share the link of the recording. So even if we're not able to post that publicly on our website, um, we can share that. So if you have interest in the recording, we should be able to, to do that. Thank you, Katie. Were there any other questions from the audience that you would like to add into the chat box at this time? We'll give people one more minute in case there's any any last thoughts that you have. Um, if you think of more questions, um, we can also share again the speaker contacts so that you can ask those after the fact as well. We do have a few questions coming in. Um, one of the questions is, what are the birds on the screen right now? Oh, um, a lot of those, the, especially the the bright red ones, are red knots. In fact. There's a, there's a couple that aren't red knots, but the majority of those birds are red knots and they're in breeding plumage, all decked out. This is a photo that Brad Wynn took, if Brad's on, on this um, call. And they're, they're catching sunset light and glowing, I believe. <laughs> that possibly right. Um, so that's um, really fat, happy, red, red knots that are all decked out, ready to go up to the Arctic and, um, and go west. Fantastic, thank you, Abby. Um, and Athena is wondering, what population of shorebird is most endangered on Georgia coasts right now? So red knots are federally threatened, but a, a really a lot of these species that are long distance migrants that are nesting up in the Arctic face all of the same threats as red knots. So whether they're listed or not, um, you know, kind of thinking of red knots as protecting red knot habitat protects all these other species as well, um, like ready turnstones and, and like doctors. So um, there's, there's a lot of threatened species, whether they have those designations or not. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And again, if we don't get to your question during the session, um, we'll try and send answers in our follow up email. Um, and you can contact our speakers as well. Um, but Laura is wondering what efforts are being made to educate all of the boaters who occupy sandbars and bring dogs. This has been a problem Catherine and I have been talking about recently because it, we, we've uh, seen it every, every, every weekend especially now with so many other boats out there really isn't a big effort i mean it it it, it you know in chatham county here there's a leash law which applies it front of barrier island um but it's not followed uh, no at all i think uh, education and signage uh before people get out there with their dogs is key yeah one of the things that i'm working on um with this whole larger problem of disturbance is uh is a project that i'm um has funding pending right now but it would be exactly that to figure out which are the most high access high use access points for some of these more remote places that recreational boaters go to and really trying to engage boaters before they get out to these sites mm -hmm. is a real problem and access for enforcement is a real problem um, so, so trying to engage with those folks before they even get to those places to make them more aware. And I think there are some really great opportunities there because a lot of these folks are local people that care about those places. Mm -hmm. You know, 
it's like their little patch of sand that they've gone to every single year. It's their <laughs> but helping them understand um, what is going on from an ecological perspective and understand how their actions make some really significant impacts. I think um, we could, again, similar to this program, really trying to engage the community and building a cultural shift where it's less about enforcement and more about building partnerships. And, and so that's one of the problems that that we're, mm -hmm. we're hoping to address through a, a project that hopefully we'll get paying for and be able to really um, dig into that because it is a really big problem. Thank you, Abby. Um, and again, if people are interested in continuing to engage with this and be part of that education, um, we encourage you to stay connected with us. Um, and Abby or Katie, do you have any last words before we wrap up? Just a giant thank you for participating and for your input. Um, I really appreciate that everybody's been able to give a little bit of input. Um, and that follow-up email will include um, some survey information just to find out more. Um, if you have interest in continuing with the program, please include that. Um, if you follow a link that we'll put in there, we'll find you, we'll have your email contact. And if you'd like to stay on our contact list, just let us know. So thank you very much. And maybe a big thank you again to Stacia and Catherine and Fran for joining us and sharing their perspectives. And thanks to everyone um, for joining and for being enthusiastic and being engaged and um, trying to come up with some creative ways that we can address some of these big problems and make our coast a nice place in the future. And Stacia has- Thank that. you all. Well, thank you again, um, and feel free to, whenever you're ready, you can leave the, the meeting by clicking that leave meeting on the right hand side, um, and then stay tuned for other virtual programs happening all summer with UJ Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant every Tuesday and Thursday and a handful of Fridays as well. And we have a lot of programming at Manomet as well too, so if folks want to keep learning about shorebird stuff, um, there will be a lot of opportunities if you go to our website. All right, thank you for joining. Thank you all so much. Bye. <laughs>